Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to talk about digests and a few other uh, important legal resource, legal research tools, excuse me. Um, let me show you where you'll find some stuff about this topic. We're in our Canvas classroom. We're just going to scroll down to module four, which is labeled digest. That may be the label for the module, but we're going to cover a couple of other resources in addition to digest. And then we're going to get on Westlaw and play around there a little bit. So I'm just going to open up the PowerPoint and here we go. So um, you'll find lots of resources about this topic in your textbook. Uh, most of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, but I would say virtually all of them are going to be in your textbook. Uh, just look for uh, the places that talk about digest or um, ALR or uh, words and phrases. The Westlaw portion probably will be described in the textbook, but I believe that that's one of those things that you really need to see to understand. And even better than seeing is doing. So I'm going to recommend that when we get to that portion of the presentation, you pause me and you go ahead and log on to Westlaw either before or after or even during the time that you watch the presentation. So let's get started. So what is a digest? Well, a digest is uh, basically just a, a list of little kind of case blurbs. Uh, the most important thing about it isn't so much the blurbs, it's how they're organized. You know, the way that reporters are organized, if we were to open up, say, a Southwestern reporter and turn to page 400, well, we might have a contract case, and right after that, we might have a murder case. We might have a case from Kentucky and then a case from Texas. We might have uh, a, uh, a tort case, a car accident case. We might have a, a theft case after that. There's no rhyme or reason to the order, um, and as a result, uh, you know, the, the main organization theme is, is chronology. And even that's kind of imperfect because usually you'll see that they will put a, a block of Texas cases together, then a block of Kentucky cases together, and a block of Arkansas cases together, and so forth. And so it might be that if you were going to arrange it strictly chronologically, that they would be more mixed up than they are. But generally speaking, they're roughly chronological. And as you can imagine, we've got criminal cases coming down every day. We've got breach of contract cases coming down every day. And so if I were to say to you, um, let's say I'm the assigning attorney and I say to you, I need you to research um, cases about uh, best interest of the child. It's a child custody situation. And let's assume that there's an issue with one of the parents having a substance abuse problem. And so I'm going to need you to find cases. Well, if we didn't have things like digest, and there are other tools too, but if we didn't have something like digest, you'd have to start from the first Southwestern reporter and look through each one of those books and mentally say, oh, that one's about murder. No, nope, that's not relevant. That one's about bank robbery. Oh, no, that's not relevant. That one's about breach of contract. No, that's not relevant. And you can see how that would take essentially a ridiculous amount of time completely not the best use of your time. So what Westlaw has done is it's hired people to go through and do exactly that, but do it once. And each one of these cases, they identify what the topics are covered. And so the cases that are about uh, best interest of the child, um, and they get more granular than that, but just take that category. They'll put all of those cases together, and then all of the murder cases go together, and all of the breach of contract cases go together. And again, they get more granular than that. They get more specific, but um, it, they're going to group them by topic. And then, so what you do as the legal researcher is you, you find the topic that you're interested in, you go to that book if you're using books and you flip to that section and you'll see all these blurbs. And this is when you start thinking, hmm, which one of these cases am I going to actually read? 
back in the day, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go to the stacks and actually pull these books down from the shelves. So, you know, it was kind of a cumbersome process. You're probably not going to pull down a hundred. Um, if you're on Westlaw, it's a little easier to do this kind of triage pretty quickly. But if you're pulling down the books, you're probably going to be looking for things like, is this the right jurisdiction? If I'm in Texas, I probably don't care about how they handle uh, best interest of the child in Kentucky. Um, is this from the Texas Supreme Court? Mm, I'm probably going to be pretty interested in that. If I'm the Fifth Court of Appeals, the Dallas Court of Appeals, I'm probably going to be interested in that as well. Um, I may not be so interested in what Eastland does, especially if I'm finding a lot of cases from the Texas Supreme Court and the Fifth Court of Appeals that seems relevant. And so it helps me to sort through. Let's say there are just a ton of cases out there. Well, then I might start looking for recent cases. And then of course I'm going to look at the pocket parts and and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And then I'll also uh, you know check the dates. I'm going to want cases that are relatively recent. Before I do the search I might actually look up the statute and see the date that it became law so I can see that's probably when I want to start. Uh, if I have lots of cases to choose from that's probably when I'm going to want to start to look at cases. If I don't have a lot of cases, then I'm willing to look for cases before the statute, although I'd want to make a notation, hey, these are cases that might be under a different statute or might be under some kind of common law interpretation. If the statute changed things, I probably need to adjust my research. So that's what a digest is. And uh, that's kind of also why we want to use it. Because the summary is just really short and not prepared by the court, you can't ever cite the little summary. Um, it's not part of the opinion and it's just an aid for you as you find research tools. It's the same head notes that you find when you do a Westlaw search and, and we'll go and do that in a little bit. Here's an example of the, the Digest for Texas. It's literally called Texas Digest. It's got kind of a bright blue color. It's very similar actually to the color of the blue book. This is a little bit darker maybe than uh, I would say the color is. And then the lettering is kind of a gold, uh, pretty shiny type gold uh, look to it. Um, not every state has a digest. California has one. New York has one. Some of the more populous ones do. I'm, I'm guessing there's others that are combined into various, uh, uh, you know, regional uh, digests. But of course, for us, this is the one that is the one that's most helpful for us. We actually do have a copy of this in our library on the Spring Creek campus. And so you might find it interesting to look at that. This is prepared, as you can see, by West, which is the company that is Westlaw. And it basically is a paper version of what that we can find on Westlaw. Obviously, Westlaw is much quicker, much easier to use. Um, and so if you have a Westlaw subscription, you're almost certainly not going to use it if it's an unlimited type subscription, which almost all of them are these days. You're not going to want to use a paper version. But if you don't have a Westlaw subscription, the paper versions may be a good investment of your time. So let's go to the next page. So head notes, these are the notes that appear before the decision. Let me just show you what they look like now so that we can be looking. So I'm just Somehow or another, I got out of um, Westlaw. Sorry about that. Lately, my Westlaw has been coming up on the docket sheet which isn't necessarily that helpful for us. Although I will tell you, if you have an interest in Texas legal things, you can see the Collin County docket. So um, just by clicking on Texas and then going to Collin County. But we're not interested in dockets right now, so I'm gonna click on home base. And I'm just going to find a case. Um, just a quick little thing here. Here's our case. Here, it, here are the headnotes 
foreign employees covenant not to sue to be ancillary to or part of an enforceable agreement. Number one, the consideration given by the employer and the otherwise enforceable agreement must give rise to the employer's interest in restraining the employee from competing and the covenant must be designed to enforce the employee's uh, consideration or return promise in the otherwise enforceable agreement. I think that might be directly from the statute verbatim. And you can see here, a covenant not to compete is not designed to enforce a notice provision in an employment agreement. And you can see this particular one has a total of 18 headnotes. And you can see if I'm interested, oh, this is exactly what I, I was doing my research about. I can click on 13 and it'll take me to that portion of the case. When I'm done, I can go back to my headnotes. So these are what the headnotes look like. You can see they have a little key, so that tells you that you can, you know, think about the key number. And you can see here, this is the key for restraint of trade or competition or competition in trade. So it's the contracts, which is 95, and this is a subcategory here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. So that's what a head note is. It's just a brief paragraph that tells you what's going on in that particular opinion. So each head note is going to uh, pertain to a very discrete legal topic. So an opinion that has 15 topics is going to have 15 head notes. But again, these topics are very specific. So when you read the opinion, you might think to yourself, oh, this particular document just has two or three topics. But Westlaw really parses it down to the nitty gritty. And so that uh, uh, opinion that seemed to have only two or three topics, probably according to Westlaw, has 15 or more. And each head note is going to have one or more key numbers. I'm just going to click on this right here so you can see all of the key numbers that exist. And here is the list. And you can see they have categories for 450. Going back up here to 95, you can see that's the one for contracts. And this, this same system will work for digests or for um, uh, Westlaw. It's the same system. It's just one's a paper version and one is, is uh, an online version. But it's basically the, the online version is just the book in print. Um, there are um, over 450, or I think 450 categories. And then each one of these categories it, uh, Westlaw gets much more granular and they break down into over 100,000 separate concepts. So the 450 is like this portion. Let me show you. Going back here. So there's 450 of the broad categories like contracts, statutes, injunction. Let's just click on contracts for a second. You can see it takes us to 95 contracts. You can see it says it there, West Key Number System. Well, let, me, let me go back there. That was a good visual here. And this shows you how granular we've gotten. Here's the big category. There's a, a, a subcategory, a sub subcategory, a sub sub subcategory. And that's where we are on the one I clicked on. I can't remember which one I clicked on. Maybe it was this one, restraint of trade or competition. Let's just click on that for a second. And you can see again, this is uh, down here, restraint of trade. So we're, we can just drill down, drill down, more specific, more specific, more specific. And if you were doing this in the book, you'd be flipping pages. So each head note in opinion will be numbered. We can see here, this is number 13. And again, even though it says statutes, if we go behind the scenes, it will have a key number 361. And again, you can get more granular from that perspective. And the head num numbers will appear in the text of the opinion. So you'll be able to immediately connect, well, where in the opinion? I mean, if it's a two-page opinion, it's probably not that important. It points you directly to the page. If it's a 50-page opinion, you're going to be very glad that there's that direct link that's going to take you to exactly the section of the opinion that's relevant.
Here's an example. Again, I showed you one online, which probably is better. Um, the head notes can help you quickly do some triage. You know, you have a research topic, you don't have time to in-depth read 400 cases, but you probably have time to scan the head notes, you know, the little summary at the beginning of the case. Let me flip back to that. Go back. So the, 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 the quickest triage you can do is just read this. And then the next level might be scan these. And you could probably honestly scan the, 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 the category here and this in two, three minutes. So it might be reasonable. You might be able to do 100 or 200 cases in pretty quick order. Where, where it would take you, you know, days to read 100 cases probably from beginning to end. So it's a tremendous time saver. And they help you, not only do they help you decide is this case relevant, but they help you decide which portions of the case should I focus on. So let's say you're going through this and you're saying, well, maybe this is relevant. Just click and go. And now you can read this paragraph and decide in more detail. Oh, no, it's not quite as good as I thought it was going to be. So again, you can use the written books, the digest, or you can use Westlaw. In this class, we're going to use Westlaw because that library is far away <laughs> and we can't get into that library at this point in any event. So sometimes you don't start with a topic. I don't say, well, go find, you know, best interest of the child cases. Maybe you're given the name of a case. Go find the Sheshinov case and find, find uh, cases related to that that talk about um, the idea of uh, what types of non-competes, I went too far back, here we go, what types of non-competes are good. And so I decide, oh, this is one that's good. Well, I can go to the opinion and find cases that cite in this area. For example, I could look at uh, citing references or I can also find cases that maybe never cited Sheshinov, but talk about the same topic. And I can do that just by clicking on this button here. So I'm going to find cases like Stone Coat of Texas versus CalPro Stone Design. This is a case that's more recent. This just came out less than a year ago. So this isn't going to be listed within the body of the Sheshinov case. This opinion may not even cite Sheshinov. Let's just see if it does. Sheshinov's a pretty big case in this area, so it might. So I'm going to um, do Sheshinov. No, so we found a case with, uh, by, by starting with Sheshinov, we found a case that doesn't mention Sheshinov, and we found a case that Sheshinov doesn't mention. And we did that through using key numbers. So once you know a case, you can almost invariably find other cases on that topic. Um, if you know the name of a case, if you know the, a topic, either way you are good to go. If you're using the book version, um, there is a table of cases. So you would look up Sheshinov in the index in, in that particular book. But you usually don't have a case. And so you may want to use things like the descriptive word index. Maybe you don't know exactly that it's a contracts topic. But you might know that the, the, your boss may have used the term non-compete or covenant not to compete. And so you can look up those words to see what's going on. Maybe that will lead you to a topic. So the descriptive word index is handy. Um, you could also just um, find, you know, look on the spine of the book and think to yourself, ah, oh, this is a contracts topic. I will go to the volume that starts with C and then um, in, in other words, I'm going to start with this right here. 
I'm going to start with this and then I'm going to drill down. I did this in the Westlaw lecture number one. So let's say we're looking at, let's see, child custody. I might click on that if I'm interested in best interest of the child. Maybe grounds and factors in general. Maybe this one. Use of drugs or alcohol. So it looks like um, we found some possibilities in here. Um, we have found five cases on this point. Um, we are in Texas only. So we have a Amarillo Court of Appeals, Houston, Waco, Corpus, San Antonio. We don't have one from the Texas Supreme Court and we don't have one from Dallas. So we'd probably go through these and kind of read them up and see what we can find out if that were our topic. So if you are using the book digest, there are series. The, the one I showed you here is a second edition. I think that they're on the third. If they are on the third, then you'd want to start with the West Texas Digest third, because obviously those are going to be the most recent cases. And you're going to want to look in the back and start with the pocket part as the absolute most recent that you can find in a book edition. Once you've gone through Texas Digest third, and maybe you're thinking, I haven't found enough, then you can go to Texas Digest second. The cases aren't going to be as recent, but maybe you'll find one that's a closer match. And of course, you can go to Texas Digest, the original, the first edition, which won't have a number on it, it'll just be West Texas Digest. And if you go to that one, again, the cases are going to be fairly old, but if it's a good match, it might still be worth your time. Now, obviously, if you're using Westlaw, you don't have to worry about going to th three different sets of books uh, because Westlaw has all of the cases arranged together. So you don't have to worry about pocket parts. You don't have to worry about going through each one of the editions. Oops, I don't know why I moved that. <laughs> here. So the head notes quickly help you evaluate the case that you're reading to see is it relevant? Is it going to be helpful for your goals? Sometimes people get confused about this and think, well that case doesn't help me. It's not good for my client. So should I ignore it? No. The, the issue isn't is it good for my case? The issue is is it relevant for my case? because cases that are bad are still things your client needs to know about. Maybe the law is bad for your client. I mean, that's going to happen, unfortunately, pretty regularly. And you need to know the cases that the other side is researching. Um, you can't change those cases, but you might be able to think about a way of distinguishing them so that they have a little bit less of a bite. And even if you can't do that, better your client know the situation now and develop realistic expectations or perhaps settle the matter. So even bad cases, in, bad in the sense that they, they harm your client's position, are important that you look at. I would say they're at least as important as the cases that are good because you're gonna have to be able to respond to it. You want the good ones, of course, but you also need the bad ones. Um, and they, again, will help you find similar cases. Again, once you find one more case and you can do that same process, you know, you know, if you find a case, if you find Sheshinov, or let's see here, let's say we find in remarriage of swim, and this is in remarriage of swim. So this is a case we think is relevant. Well, look, we have all these numbers. Maybe, oh, you know, visitation conditions, that's kind of relevant. Um, our client has a history of drug and alcohol problems. Maybe we'd be looking at some visitation restrictions. Oh, look, now we have another number. So maybe I'm interested in this case right here. 
And so you can, and once I go into this case, I might find some more head numbers. It can become a little bit of a maze. You can lose where you are. You can always go back to history and, and find, you know, maybe where you started. But, um, it, you know, it's kind of good to keep your bearings. But um, get, once you get that first case, that first key number, you, you're off of the races, so to speak. Okay, so that's our description of the key number. So let, let's just spend a little bit more time on this. So we start here on Canvas. There's a couple of different ways to go to the key numbers. The, probably the most intuitive is just to click on key numbers. And again, you have a couple of approaches here. One way, of course, is to go through a case. You know that one case, you go to it, you look at the numbers, that's going to get you one that's probably really close to the topic that you're interested in. So that's approach one. But if you don't have a case, and probably most of the time you won't, then you have a choice here. You can either kind of get more granular, start with a broad concept, contracts, whatever the, the, the topic is, and then keep on drilling down, keep on drilling down. That's one approach. Another approach is just to interest a, top, interest a topic here, best interest of child. Let's just see what that gets us. And it does give us some topics here that might be important. And again, once I have this topic, I can see, oh, this seem, uh, 76D seems to be the neighborhood I want to be in. Let me just go to that and see. Welfare and best interest of child. So now I can, you know, get to be more granular here. Um, you know, kind of see what's going on in this topic. I'm going to go back to home base and the key numbers. And so this particular time, I'm in the Texas jurisdiction. So I can approach it from here. Of course, I can change my jurisdiction any time. Most of the time you're gonna want Texas, but you know, maybe um, not particularly for this topic, but you might want federal material too. There, there won't be very much federal material at all in this topic because it's really state law driven, but you can include state and federal. There's another way to get at the same stuff, so I'm going to go back to home base. Another way to do it is to go to state materials, go to Texas, and now go to key number. Either way is equally good. It gets you to exactly the same spot. So now we're going to switch to ALR, American Law Reports. That's the official name for this, and yet Almost no one ever uses it. If you were to walk up to a legal professional and say, where's your American law reports? They would probably look at you like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then when you say, where's your ALR? The light bulb goes off. It's also owned by Wes and it also uses key numbering systems. I think Wes bought it several years ago. And so if you go back to old enough editions of ALR, they won't have the key numbers. Um, but They've owned them for quite a while, so if you go back pretty far, they will have them. Uh, Collins Library on the Spring Creek campus does have um, the ALR set, set up, and you'll see an example of it in the textbook, but guess what? You have access to it on Westlaw, so we'll play around with that for just a few minutes. Let me explain to you what ALR is like. It's a combination of a primary source and a secondary source. Oftentimes an ALR book will have, will cite a case, a major case that's come down. I'll give you an example. In 1973, I'm sure that there was a significant portion of an ALR book devoted to Roe v. Wade. And so they would have published the opinion. And when they publish the opinion, they just publish it just like, uh, you know, West publishes a Southwestern Reporter or West publishes the Federal Reporter. They just word for word take that opinion. I mean, of course, West is going to add head notes and a syllabus and things like that, but they're, they're, the words and the opinion are going to be the same. But then what ALR does is they, they also publish with it a really exhaustive, detailed article, I guess you could call it, um, that goes through, and, and I'm sure it would have discussed the ins and outs of 
um, the, the abortion law at that time in all 50 states and probably even internationally. So let's look at ALR. Let's see. Secondary sources. American Law Report is our first one. And let's say we're looking for, um, actually, let's just search uh, in our parts. And we will search it for uh, covenants not to compete. And you can see that they have a few choices. And you can see this one is published in 1973, but they update it. This one is more recently published, uh, 2018. Let's click on this one. And you can see that they give really an, an, uh, an outline. They talk about some initial issues, and then they will talk about um, you know, can kind of get more granular, but you'll see they have a ton of footnotes here. So let's just click on one. Well, actually, we can hover over it. And you can see that there are going to be quotes from lots and lots of cases. Um, people don't read ALR because it's so darn interesting. It's not like a Stephen King novel. They read it to get cases. They read it to get the law. And so they're going to focus on these footnotes. So the footnotes are actually kind of the bigger deal. Let's just click on Texas so we can get the Texas stuff. Let's see. Here we go. So it's going to put it in kind of a highlighted color. And you can see some major cases. And some of these you've seen before. Man Frankfurt, White versus Sintel. You probably saw that in the midterm. DeSantis versus Wackenhut, that's a big one. Uh, neurodiagnostic, I've seen that many times. Laser spot, I've seen that. Gallagher, how, oh yeah, this is, these are good ones. Yeah, this was a favorite topic of mine, just legally. Ah, uh, here we go. This is the case that we were looking at before. Um, so there's lots of different leads here. So you can see a whole list of cases that would be relevant to your particular topic. So um, ALR gives you a lot of, uh, I like to, to think of it as like a, a very broad thing. The odds of finding a case, easily at least, that's going to really replicate your fact pattern isn't very likely. But if you are starting the process of learning this area of the law and you don't even know the vocabulary and you don't even understand how the big pieces fit together, this can be a great place to get started. It would be one of the first places you would go if you were going to go here. Now, most people don't use ALR very often. It's not going to be a super common place to go. But it is there for you if you're like, uh, I don't know what to do. ALR is, if you find yourself in that situation, ALR may be a smart place to go to kind of get your bearings, to get the names of a few cases so you can dive in either using a key numbers or by looking at the key site history of the case and start getting that research squared away. So another place to find ALR cases is going to be within, so I'm going to go to home base again and I'm going to go to Sheshanal. We've got that case right here that we've looked at so many different times. And I am going to look at citing references. I'm going to look at secondary sources. You can see there's a lot. This is a big case. And I'm going to look at ALR. We can see that there are two 
And this is this one we just looked at. You can see this one was the other one we saw. Even though it was published in 1973 and Cheshinoff was decided in 2006, this gets updated regularly. So don't get too worried about seeing 1973 um, because the law is regularly updated with cases like Alex Cheshinoff. We're going to click on here. This is the exact same article we found by uh, going to the ALR. So you can find ALR stuff either through using Keysight or actually going to that those set of books, metaphorically going to them on uh, uh, Westlaw. And of course, if you're in a library, legal library, you can actually go into the stacks and pull the books off the shelves and look through the books. If you do that, remember to check the pocket parts because that's where the most recent cases are going to be. So if you pulled out the 1973 volume, obviously in the body of the book, nothing is going to be more recent than 1973 in the body. But in the pocket part is where you'll see cases like Alex Sheshinoff, which was decided in 2006. Okay, so each volume has about 10 articles. And again, they're highly annotated. With, and usually there's gonna be cases from every single state, unless that state just doesn't have any laws. Um, and the essays are gonna be much longer really than the cases in many cases. It's in outline format as we saw um, in the example that I pulled up. And it gives you lots of other places to look. And if you're doing it online, you can just click on those links and and go forward. So if we're looking at this one and I decide I'm really interested in you know practice pointers and I really like this number five. Oh and gosh this case looks like exactly what I need. Well, you know, that easily, I'm in it. Much, much quicker than if you were to pull off books off the shelves. Um, as I said before, a, a good way to find articles is that key citing tool by going into a case, by going to citing references, using secondary sources, you're going to get the ALR articles. ALR is usually going to be the first. It's one of the most popular secondary sources to use through the Keysight process. We think about Keysight as being a way to confirm that cases are still good law, and that is probably the most important function of Keysight, but it's also a really great research tool to find more cases, um, more recent cases that talk about a particular topic. Um, you're going to find hundreds of cases and lots of discussion, but you know you probably have a pretty narrow issue to deal with. And ALR is better for the big picture stuff. It's not going to be that granular on a particular topic. And so it's probably not, once you get your bearings in the area of law and you have kind of the terminology down, you're going to want to flip on over to um, key numbers or that one case you found and find the cases that that case cites and go from there and some key, key citing. So here's when you might want to use ALR. When your research project is very broad or your final project needs to be exhaustive, your boss expects you to talk about all the major cases in this area. Well, you're going to get those through ALR, especially if you look at that pocket part. Um, sometimes you might be asked to do a very broad research project. Maybe the client wants to have a deeper understanding of kind of how this area of the law is in broad terms. Another time to use it is you're stumped. You've tried the other approaches. You don't have the name of a statute. You don't have the name of a case. You don't know enough about the area of the law even to really know how to find a key number. You may find that ALR is going to help. And sometimes legal issues are, are challenging. And so if you dive into the weeds and really get into minutia, but you don't get don't understand the big picture, it's hard to make sense of it when you're looking at, you know, it's a little bit like if you were to have a, a bird's wing under a magnifying glass. You're not really going to be able to understand how that bird's wing uh, relates to the rest of the bird's body 
when you're looking at it under the micros microscope. So you need to have a little bit of pull away, a little bit of a more big picture to make sense of it under those circumstances. The um, way to find resources in ALR is very similar to the way we did it with Digest. So if you're looking for the book version, they're going to have lots of indices, they're going to have key numbers. Just remember to check the pocket parts. That's probably the most important thing. And if you can do it on Westlaw, do it on Westlaw. So because ALR is a combination of primary and secondary source, it is possible to cite the cases in ALR just as you would from any other reporter. That's fairly rare. I'm going to be honest with you. Most people are going to flip and find that case in a more traditional reporter, but it's not wrong to. Um, it's a, it is a valid reporter and so you can cite things from there. Because it also does secondary stuff and that's what people think of it as, that's kind of the reason why it's not as good to cite it there because people will be thinking, well, you know, the secondary source aspects aren't, I mean, they're very reputable, very respected, but still it would, it might be a little confusing for folks because people don't think of the fact that ALR actually does cite cases. And you can also use ALR as a very credible secondary source. Um, so head notes you can't ever cite, case summary, syllabi you can't ever cite, but you can cite ALR, and not just the case, but the secondary source. Words and phrases. Um, words and phrases is huge. <laughs> um, you probably won't ever see the whole set of words and phrases. Um, it's a, a huge collection. And it sounds like it would be maybe a dictionary or something. No, it's not a dictionary. It is a collection of kind of lots and lots of different places where a particular word or phrase is used. So let's say the phrase that you're looking up is res ipsa loquitur. That probably isn't going to have a lot of meaning for you, but that's a term of art that comes up. Res ipsa loquitur. It means literally in Latin, the thing speaks for itself. And that uh, has a, a more specific meaning in uh, uh, the legal context. And so that would, let's say you just want to see all the cases in Texas, for example, that talks about res ipsa loquitur. Words and phrases might be a way of approaching that. Now, I think it has become less helpful than it once was because tools like Westlaw and Lexis allow you to do word searches. So you can go into um, Westlaw and type in uh, res ipsa loquitur. <laughs> There's actually a company with that name. Um, and you can see cases that talk about that. So there was a Texas Supreme Court case that talked about it as recently as 1990. And you can see there's actually even a key number that's res ipsa loquitur. And you can find, again, additional uh, cases that have come up over time. So uh, Westlaw will let you kind of pull together your own words and phrases. But before Westlaw existed, um, if you knew a phrase, but you didn't necessarily, you just wanted to see how those words appeared in opinion after opinion, uh, the, the tool for it was words and phrases. So it's not a dictionary. Um, you can't cite words and phrases because again, it's just snippets of cases. I mean, snippets of, of that particular case. It's kind of like a digest in that sense. It basically just lists cases in which that particular word or that particular phrase was re commonly used. And um, that's it. So hopefully this was helpful for you. If you have any questions or um, you want to... Um, Um, 
or you have any questions or, or you uh, uh, would like some support when, when you're working on these matters, please feel free to stop by my office hours. Um, and uh, I guess that pretty much ends our discussion of digest, ALR, and words and phrases. Thanks so much for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.